Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where this morning there was no Star Wars teaser trailer teaser on Good Morning America. They said they had a big announcement, but it was for charity, which is awesome, uh, and they're giving away some fan experiences. I'll put a link down below to learn more about that. But the reason there was no trailer today, I mean, we never expected the full teaser trailer today because we all know it's coming Friday at the last Jedi panel at Star Wars Celebration. That's the big Star Wars convention. Uh, but it's interesting because while most conventions like Comic-Con or D23 are very, well, are primarily forward thinking and they're all about big announcements about what comes next, most of Star Wars Celebration is about genuinely being a celebration of Star Wars. Introspective uh, panels, uh, fans meeting and just talking about all things Star Wars. And they really confine their biggest announcements to the one panel on Friday, which starts at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's in Orlando. Interestingly, not at the Walt Disney World Resort, even though they do have convention space there. Instead, it's at the um, Orange County Convention Center. But it streams online on the Star Wars website, which I think is quite nice of them. They don't charge you for it. Uh, but if you want to tune in, uh, last year uh, they had um, Ben Mendelsohn show up in character as Director Krennic. It was quite fun. Uh, and they, of course, uh, premiered Rogue, the Rogue One, one of the Rogue One trailers. Uh, they were a little further ahead, I think, in the Rogue One ad campaign at that point. We knew a little bit more. Uh, we'd certainly seen Orson Krennic, uh, but they're being quite secretive about um, The Last Jedi. So expect big things on Friday. But something else that's going to happen on uh, at Star Wars Celebration over the weekend is that Mark Hamill, who will be there, of course, to promote The Last Jedi, which he is a big part of, uh, finally, uh, you know, coming back. Uh, it's finally his turn to return. Uh, but he's going to do an in-memoriam panel for Carrie Fisher, which I think is quite lovely. Uh, and it's, good, it's really, I think, to some degree, kicking off this new phase of the discussion of Carrie Fisher's Princess Leia and both, you know, the actor, the actress and the character's legacy and continued involvement in Star Wars, what that's going to be. And not only are we going to do in memoriams like Mark Hamill's, but for instance, it was announced over the weekend that Todd Fisher, her, uh, Carrie Fisher's uh, brother, uh, and her daughter, Billy Lord, have given permission to Disney to use footage of Carrie Fisher, I think, I believe mostly filmed for episode eight so that she can appear in episode nine. Uh, they have said, though, that there will be no digital recreation of Carrie Fisher. It's going to all be footage that was pr uh, previously shot before her death. She'd finished filming on episode eight. And this is, uh, you know, just so that she can finish out the trilogy. Uh, but I do believe that this is just the next step in getting audiences to accept a digital version of Carrie Fisher, because I just don't think they could possibly have enough footage to make this believably work, and, and also in a meeting, meaningful way. I mean, we don't just want Princess Leia walking in the background, right? I think, you know, you want some, some genuine interaction, etc. So I think you could do something like, you know, her daughter could do the motion capture for it or something, and I think they could find a way to make it respectful, uh, but yet creatively you know, meaningful uh, for both, again, the actress and the character, you know, her legacy and, and you know, Princess Leia going forward. Uh, so believe me, I think definitely going digital. This is just to get you more okay with it. And think about it. At that point, episode nine is 2019. You'll have already seen an entire film after Carrie Fisher's, you know, tragic passing. So you'll become more acclimated to the idea of seeing her uh, you know, you know, kind of like the way Heath Ledger is the Joker. And I think when everyone saw Heath Ledger as the Joker, everyone agreed that it kind of took on this, you know, immortality, you know, it went beyond the actor. And so I think maybe Disney's to some degree hoping that that's how you'll feel when you see Carrie Fisher in episode eight. Now, I felt a little bad because um, her family was accused of doing this for money. I saw in some of the comment sections, you know, just cashing in on Carrie Fisher's death. And I thought that was really rude because I don't agree at all. I think that they're, I totally believe them when they say they're doing it for Carrie Fisher's legacy and so that she can have a kind of immortality living on forever through the Star Wars brand. I think that's actually kind of beautiful. And I think what I hope for, uh, and I, I think would be, uh, you know, quite lovely for Carrie Fisher. And she, she, she would be, I think, quite fortunate. So what's also very interesting, in my opinion, is that it really makes you rethink Harrison Ford forcing the Star Wars team to kill off Han Solo in Episode 7, or else he wouldn't have returned for that, for that movie at all. Because, you know, Han Solo doesn't get a Force ghost. You know, that's why Harrison Ford was okay with returning, because he knew it would be for the last time. He doesn't like playing Han Solo. Whatever. See ya, Harrison. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think it's funny you don't like the biggest thing that ever happened to your career and made you a household name. But anyway, 
Uh, because, you know, he wouldn't have gotten Indiana Jones if it hadn't been for Han Solo because it's the same creative people. But anyway, uh, you know, he just unceremoniously died in episode seven, toppling off of a bridge. Uh, you know, I don't think it was particularly organic and he can never return. And I think it kind of like shortens the character. You know, they're going to go back in time and have young Han Solo coming up, of course. But this idea that the character lives on forever, you know, has an Obi-Wan Kenobi type feel, right? And so Princess Leia is going to have, I think, I think Princess Leia will take an Obi-Wan Kenobi type feel feel as well. I think they will elevate the character, which is pretty interesting. Now, on that note, for even furthermore, let's evolve this conversation a step further. Everybody loves Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan Kenobi, and we all want an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie. Maybe they'll announce one at Star Wars Celebration during that panel. That would be pretty amazing. Um, because Ewan McGregor's alive, he wants to do it, and we all want to watch it. I don't know why, therefore, it's not happening. Nobody asked for young Han Solo. So anyway, though, like the young, young Han Solo movie and a potential Ewan McGregor Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, after enough time passes even more so beyond a digital Carrie Fisher, and also let's remember that she was okay, she approved a digital version of herself for Rogue One. So you already have that precedent set, I think, which also will help Disney eventually get there. But at some point, could another actress play Princess Leia in a set of films? Uh, and I think that would really go a long way towards making the character even more iconic, right? That she would get her own series. And I think it would be nice, you know, people always talk about Princess Leia and she's certainly iconic and she has some, you know, some looks that everybody can just instantly recognize. And I think Carrie Fisher herself did a lot for the character's profile through using it to talk about mental illness and addiction. So. I think that's all really, and also she's one of the most famous cosplays of all time. But I think that in terms of Princess Leia's personality as a character within Star Wars, not quite as developed as some other characters. So, and also she's very interesting because, you know, you have Rey, which is very much like a, a new, new school girl power type character. I think that Princess Leia is a very old school girl power type of character. And, you know, I think she's, um, you know, she still very much feels like a, like a princess. So I think it would be interesting to, you know, explore that in some films. But I think as long as they don't cast an ingenue who's just using it as a stepping stone for her own career, and you get someone who's like really a, a great actress and has the same kind of zinger quality to her that um, Carrie Fisher uh, had, I think it would work. I've seen you guys suggest Sarah Paulson. I think she would be fabulous. Uh, and then also, Amelia Clark's in the upcoming Young Han Solo movie, and this is, of course, before Han Solo met Your Highness, so I don't think that she's playing uh, Princess Leia, but she would have made a great Princess Leia. So I think there are candidates out there, and even if those two don't work, I think that their existence proves that there's somebody out there. All right, so that's the first story of the day, and I'd be curious how you feel about Carrie Fisher and Princess Leia's place in the Star Wars universe as uh, we move forward and time passes. How do you feel about it? And do you think Disney so far is doing a good job handling, um, you know, paying homage to her? Now, the second story of the day is about AMC and how they're aggressively going after millennial moviegoers. And they're going to actually do a $700 million upgrade, which is going to upgrade the theaters on two fronts. This was covered in the New York Times over the weekend. Pretty interesting article. One is lazy boy seating. Uh, you know, the number of theaters already have this, but they're going to continue to roll out this uh, this upgrade where they take traditional movie theater seats and they upgrade them to pleather recliners that are, of course, reserved seating. Uh, and so they're going to continue to do that, very popular. But then they're also going to upgrade their kitchens because they feel one of the keys to getting people to come into the theater is better food options. You know, they're taking a cue from, for instance, Alamo Draft House or IPIC theaters that have full kitchens. Uh, although I have to tell you, having been to IPIC, I'm not a big fan of eating while I watch a movie, like a, like a legit meal. Because, And I've also been to some of AMC's dine-in theaters. They already have some dine-in theaters that have complete kitchens as well. But these kinds of food options will be available at all their theaters. I don't like it because, first of all, it's very hard to eat in the dark while you're watching a movie. I think also if you can't really see the food, you don't really get the same culinary experience. So it's just kind of like wasted calories. And then also you rob yourself of the ability to have dinner before or after the movie and talk to the people you've gone to the movies with, you know, actually interact with them. It's fun to go to the movie, to dinner after the movie and talk about it. So anyway, some of, these are some of the options that they're going to be adding, right? Uh, one is a chicken waffle sandwich, which is not, not an open faced. It's two giant waffles with chicken in it uh, and curly fries. So that's a pretty big meal. Uh, but they're also going to have healthier options as well. Uh, but then they didn't really talk about those, though. They're like, that's not going to get anybody into the theater. They're also going to offer four types of flatbread pizza. 
Uh, not, that's not like the traditional pizza, individual pizzas they sell now. This is like fancy flatbread pizza. And they're also gonna have gourmet popcorn, like caramel corn popcorn. Uh, and they're also, and although the bucket they showed them scooping it into is so much caramel uh, popcorn, you're gonna make yourself sick. <laughs> and then also uh, like cheese popcorn, etc. And you know, the New York Times was like, well, isn't this gonna create an odor in the theater? And they were like, we want it to. We want other people to smell the food and be like, I want what that person's having. And I'm like, eh, like here's the thing. I don't really want to smell a chicken waffle sandwich while I'm watching a movie, right? Uh, especially if I'm not eating it. <laughs> and then also, you know, they have such a hard time keeping the theater clean as is, how they, I mean, I don't want a giant waffle under my seat. <laughs> I think that would be pretty bad. And I also think uh, in terms of, you know, rodent control all right <laughs> so that's one thing but i think what's very interesting though is that so far so good so far amc's efforts to uh, upgrade their experience has been effective which is not only important because there's been a decline in moviegoers recently but of course we're having that discussion about moving to streaming a film you know in a very short window like two weeks after its theatrical release and that's expected to happen by the end of the year. So AMC is being very proactive and aggressively trying to, you know, institute this change, I guess, so it's ready for when that happens. But again, as I said, they're already getting results. But this is interesting for two reasons. The results they're getting and also uh, giving you an idea of how few people go to the movies. All right. So after three years of decline in the millennial age range of 18 to 24, uh, and, that's, and they're counting in the U.S. and Canada, they got a 26% increase. Uh, so in 2016, and I also think movies should get some credit for this, right? Uh, but they went from 5.2 frequent, this is frequent moviegoers, so it's like you go regularly to the movies, from 5.2 million millennials frequently going to the movies to 7.2 million. That's a 2 million increase. That's amazing. That's like a 26% increase is huge. Double digits. I'm very impressed. If I AMC, I would be approving this upgrade for sure to try and see if I can get the number even higher. But to give you some perspective, uh, I looked it up at the last U.S. Census, and this is in the U.S. alone, by the way. So the 7.2 million 18 to 24-year-olds that go to the movies regularly is for the U.S. and Canada. But in the U.S. alone, there are 31.2 million millennials. So that means that this is less than a third. So that means over two-thirds of millennials find something else to do with their time than go to the movies frequently. And that's shocking. So uh, keep working in Hollywood. That's why they want to do the streaming because there's an even larger group that's just opting out of going to the movie. So if, think about it. If you were the studios and you said, okay, one third, I've gotten it up to a, about a third of millennials going to the movies frequently, but two thirds still refuses to go. They're spending that time instead streaming. So they're going to stream my movie eventually anyway. Why not get to them earlier? And in exchange for getting them earlier access, I can charge those millennials like a much higher price point. I mean, that's a very attractive business deal. And um, I, I think it makes perfect sense. So it's interesting. It's very interesting. I think that you know, it's it's easy to think that everyone goes to the movies when, you know, you're like us and you talk about movies all the time and you go to the movies all the time and your friends go to the movies all the time. Sometimes it's hard to imagine that so many people simply opt out. But then you see numbers like this and you can see what you can get a better idea of what's driving some of the studio decisions. Now, speaking of reinvention, Brett Ratner uh, reinvented himself a couple of years ago because he could no longer get work as a director, but he wanted to stay in Hollywood. So good for him. He reinvented himself as a film financier with Rat Pack, which funds most of Warner Brothers' slate of films. When you go and see a Warner Brothers movie, the Rat Pack logo is at the beginning. And whenever I see it, I say, good for you, Brett Ratner, keeping yourself in the game. But he wants to... He wants to go back to directing. I think he's like, I think enough time has passed. I'd like to see maybe if I can stick a toe back in the creative. Uh, for instance, he recently made headlines for his Rotten Tomatoes comment, which I don't know. I could see where he was coming from, but I think that Brett Ratner is the last person that should have a problem with, you know, labeling films as not great. You know, this, you know, a witch hunt. I think there is some element to that, as we've discussed some t sometimes. But I think that, you know, I think Brett Ratner just doesn't come from a good place. Although it's interesting, uh, the movie that really I think was the final nail in the coffin for him in terms of how moviegoers felt about him was X-Men The Last Stand. But that's actually one of the most successful X-Men films of all time, at least until the R-rated installments came about. 
But anyway, the last movie that Brett Ratner directed was Hercules. Well, like major film he directed was Hercules with Dwayne Johnson, which was very popular before it came out. Everybody was interested in this. It got it was there's a lot of interest online. Videos that talked about uh, Dwayne Johnson and Hercules did very well, as I remember. Uh, and so it was like it was a hot movie. But then when it came out, it just completely fizzled because it wasn't very good. It was like a Saturday morning cartoon, but in all the bad ways. Uh, so anyway, that really was kind of like. Uh, the second nail, the third nail in the coffin, and he just had to become a film financier. But now he's trying, as again, as I said, to maybe come back. And right now he's, it's in a producing capacity as he develops a Hugh Hefner movie. Uh, and maybe he'll direct it. Maybe. And right now it's being pitched in the trades, you know, to get people excited about it. As kind of like in the vein of the social network of Straight out of Compton, where you do a biography on, you know, these, these iconic individuals, right? You got uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you've got... Um, you know, uh, Straight Outta Comp, the Straight Outta Compton crew, like uh, uh, Dr. Dre. Like at the end of Straight Outta Compton, when you when you see what everybody in that group has accomplished and you know how it, it affects what happens today, it's like amazing, right? But that's I think that's the big difference. Hugh Hefner and Playboy are no longer relevant. I think they missed the window on doing a, a, a Hugh Hefner movie. I mean, just recently, Playboy was like, we're not going to have nude photos. And then now, I, I don't know if you saw this, but much, 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 in a much more quiet fashion, they announced that they're going back to nude photos. And I think what you're really seeing are the death nails, okay, of Playboy, the Playboy brand. And if there's no interest in the product, why would there be an interest in the man who created it, right? People are interested in Mark Zuckerberg because everybody uses Facebook, right? And it's also, you know, it's the new digital frontier. People are interested in Straight Outta Compton because it's so influential, it continues to be so influential today. Uh, not only in terms of the music industry, but I think a lot of the social discussion that it introduced into the popular culture. Uh, so Hugh Hefner and Playboy, I think, seem dated. It's almost like Mad Men or Howard Hughes. Hollywood's obsessed with Howard Hughes. They, they keep making movies about him. For instance, the most recent was Rules Don't Apply with Warren Beatty, which is actually not a bad movie. It wasn't a great movie, but it was a good movie. Uh, but just nobody cared, you know. And I think that I think that uh, Brett Ratner is going to discover that Howard Hughes and uh, Hugh Hefner are very similar in terms of uh, you know mainstream uh, interest. Uh, so I'd be curious though, are you at all interested in a Hugh Hefner movie or Brett Ratner returning to directing? All right, so those are the three stories of the day. And speaking of the business of movies, I have a very interesting question from uh, Zakiria Tariq. And Zakiria says, Grace, I have a viewer question. How is a movie's budget determined? Talent? Genre like comic books? And who has the final say? The studio? Amazing work as always. Ah, thank you, Zakaria. I appreciate that. And great question. I think it's really interesting. I don't get asked questions like this a lot. So let's discuss. So there are two ways, there are two approaches that are taken to deciding the budget for, for a movie, right? So one is, what does the filmmaker need to do it right, okay? But then that needs to be balanced with, what does the studio think it will potentially make back, realistically make back? You know, you want to make a profit on these movies, right? So they don't want to give it a budget that they have no hope of getting back. And they have to also factor in what they need to spend on advertising. So that's kind of how they decide what, to, how, what the budget should be. Uh, so and it's just like anything, like if anything you were going to spend money on any creative endeavor, right? You know, especially if it was a business, you know, how, you know, if you don't do it right, it's definitely not going to make any money, but you don't want to spend so much money on it that, uh, it won't, it couldn't, it could never possibly be profitable. And then also sometimes, you know, like Jason Blum has built a whole career, an empire actually, on lowballing his budgets, making movies super cheap so that he just has huge profits. And that's become part of his, like, uh, his image, right? The, the profit king. Like his movies are super profitable. Like, yeah, he could, he makes so much money on them now. Sure, he could raise his budgets a little bit. He could double them and still have tremendous uh, profits. But there's something about be, being such a lean and mean movie machine uh, that I think also feeds into his PR, his publicity. So it's very savvy. Uh, and also, why double your budget if you can get results like Get Out for $5 million? <laughs> That's amazing. All right, so, so anyway, the way that the budget is decided officially, though, is that the producer of the film negotiates it with the studio for the budget. They say, okay, well, I'm putting this package together. What do you think, what are you going to give me, right? That's if they need the money from the studio. So a studio gets their money from fi secured financing. Sometimes they have it themselves. Sometimes they get it through a company like Brett Ratner's Rat Pack, which again, 
funds all of Warner Brothers films. And so that gives also Brett Ratner, by the way, a seat at the table as to the movies that are uh, that are being made. Because, you know, it's their investment. It's their money. Uh, for instance, you've seen a lot of investments from China lately in studios. That money is... And also, there'll be deals, um, you know, uh, they split... Uh, box office and that box office money is you know reinvested a lot of the times in other movies I mean they take some of course for operating costs and for profit uh, but you know that's where box office money goes it goes back into the next slate of movies so that's where the studio's own money comes from and don't forget though when a movie makes money some of that has to go to Rat Pack because they're the film financier and so they want their money back plus a profit because they're a business too now, sometimes a production company has its own financing. For instance, Legendary Pictures, which started out as a film finance company, has its own money and its own deals. And so they can, they can I think, not, if not fully, mostly, um, you know, pay for their own pictures. So they just need someone to distribute it because they're not a distributor themselves. Uh, and that gives them a little bit more creative freedom because they're like, hey, we're paying for it. This is what we want to make. Uh, although, to a point, the studio says, well, I'm still going to take a bath on the prints and advertising, which I have to pay for. R right now, it's like the Blu-rays that they burn. But they're like, well, I have to pay for that. And I don't want to, you know, take a loss on that. So, and, and so, but if, um, if the production company puts up a lot of the film financing themselves, they still want the studio to sometimes contribute a little bit of film finance as well, because they're going to get money from the release, uh, and also certainly to pay for the, for the uh, advertising and the copies that go out to the, you know, the physical copies that go out to the theaters. Uh, so I hope uh, that answers your question, Zakaria, and gives you a little bit of a, good per a better perspective on how these things are decided. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today to Morning Movie News. Please write down below what you think today's top three stories, uh, Zakaria's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, any questions, of course, that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.